Hi, my name is Amanda Adomi, and today I'm going to talk to you about the exhibition We Are Sovereign with Bianca LeVay. But before I start, I'd just like to do an acknowledgement of country. I would like to acknowledge that the talk that you're listening to today is being held on the stolen lands of the Kaurna people. I would like to acknowledge all traditional owners and custodians across Australia, but particularly the Kaurna people and those joining us today. I pay my respects to all elders, past, present and emerging, and recognise the everlasting connection Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have to country and culture. Sovereignty has never been ceded and treaties have never been signed. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. So today I'm going to talk to you about um, Bianca's and mine exhibition, which is currently up at Black Diamond Tattoo until the end of the year. This land was never ceded. The pieces of my body connected to the soil and rain do not belong to you. This land belongs to no one. We are sovereign. When people ask me who my mob is, I say unknown or stolen generations. This is part of our story, our history. As an Aboriginal person growing up without any connection to culture or homelands, I often found it difficult to feel a connection or to feel part of. This is a common experience not just for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who've had their connection to culture disrupted, but also for Aboriginal people who don't fit the stereotypical image of what an Aboriginal person looks like. Too white to be black, too black to be white. Stuck in a no man's land in between. Growing up in this environment with an Aboriginal family but no cultural connections, I had an understanding of racism in all its forms and white privilege although I didn't have the words to express what I saw and experienced. When I came a part of that Aboriginal community here on Ghana Yurta in my late teenage years, and again when I began my degree in Indigenous Studies, I found myself longing for those connections. This is also a common experience, not just from stolen generations and their offspring, but for those Aboriginal peoples whose culture has been lost or much diminished. I began seeking out ways to form my own connections to country. Central to the pan-Aboriginal worldview is the earth. It's planted firmly in their cosmologies, ceremonies, rituals and practices. It is so important that we as Aboriginal people embody and invigorate as well as protect and maintain the earth and all of the natural world. As I was searching to connect to country in ways that were not appropriative, or disrespectful, I began noticing so many non-Indigenous people craving that same connection to country. I think that human beings innately crave this relationship with the natural world. Its societal constructions, human and white supremacy, colonialism, capitalism and patriarchy that cuts us off or makes us feel that we have dominion over the natural world in Western culture, feminism equates to equality, equality amongst genders. Aboriginal feminism, or an Aboriginal women's standpoint, has not just equality for genders, but equality for all living things. So for us, our feminism is not just about the equality between men and women or non-binary or trans people and other humans. It is everything in the natural world. Everything in the natural world is equal. The first step towards a meaningful connection to country when you're a guest is to acknowledge and pay respects to the traditional owners whose land has never been ceded. Its custodianship belongs to them. Acknowledgement and respect cannot be tokenistic Otherwise, you'll have a tokenistic connection. So acknowledgement and respect means learning the history, place names and peoples of the land in which you live and profit.
It may mean learning basic words in that language. For example, Nina Mani, hello in the Ghana language. Peter, which means awesome or deadly in the Ghana language. It means actively seeking out information from traditional owners, asking how you can help care for country, asking the traditional owners, and then following through with whatever advice is given, will begin to nurture a meaningful connection with country. In this exhibition, Bianca and I were examining the way that we use contemporary tattoos as a sign of allyship to the earth. In an Aboriginal worldview, when the earth is sick, the physical body is also sick. When the earth is exploited, the physical body is exploited. When the earth is raped for gas and minerals, the physical body is raped. The earth is suffering, the physical body suffers. Currently, humans are doing so poorly with Earth custodianship and protection. The Earth suffers. Both Bianca and I use contemporary tattoos as one of many other strategies and processes to connect to country. And these processes include makeup, jewellery, clothing, art, song, and other processes. The embodiment of country on skin requires suffering. For us, Bianca and I, these tattoos signify sovereignty, connection to country, and Indigenous pride. In Australia, traditionally, scarification was practiced widely. In fact, it was practiced by the Ghana people here on this place where I stand. But now it's restricted almost entirely to parts of Arnhem Land and is still an integral part of Indigenous cosmology and ritual life. Citruses, or citrix, is new tissue that forms over a wound and later contracts into a scar. And these, these are created by rubbing burnt wood, ashes, ochre, clay, even ants or other materials into the wound to produce ray scars called keloids usually in decorative patterns. Scarification marks were used by women, men and women on the chest, abdomen, shoulders, arms and thighs. Some marks record initiation and affiliations. Ancient abraded grooves at some rock art sites are the citruses of Tatum beans who visited the place in the dreaming. Other rock sites feature the figures of totemic beings with citrusization marks, giving people a record of how to copy totemic beings by, by scarifying themselves. The cards were usually made with a thin piece of rock so sharp it functioned like a surgeon's scalpel, and if used correctly would cause minimal pain to those it was used on. More jagged instruments were used to, tr to prove a man's pain threshold. Scarring is like a language inscribed on the body where each deliberate, deliberately placed scar tells a story of pain, endurance, identity, status, beauty, courage, sorrow or grief. Tattooing and scarification are similar in that both involve the insertion of pigments under the skin to create permanent marks either with pigment or texture on the surface. These days we get tattoos for so many reasons. There are some similarities in the reasons humans use contemporary tattoos and Aboriginal peoples used ritual scarification. For example, affiliation marks. Affiliation marks were made for close kin at times of birth, initiation and death. These days, no matter what our ethnicity, so many of us have affiliation marks. I know for myself, I have my son's name written on my wrist and it's not because I forget his name. I have a tribute to my grandmother and my dog and my late cat. And Bianca has a tribute to her grandparents. And I'm sure that so many of you have tributes to your loved ones. 
sorry or mortuary carts were often part of the grieving process, meant to both honour and remember someone. However, the key aspect of this process is that by physically hurting the body, you equal the emotional hurt. And as your physical wound heals, the pain also goes away. So, as you heal, you heal emotionally also. Men scar their thighs with a sharp object in an act of sympathetic bloodletting. Women scar their heads. You might have seen in the film Rabbit Proof Friends when the children were taken away, the mothers and grandmothers knocked their heads with a rock. So women scar their heads and sometimes women and men will both do their forearms as part of sorry business. Recently, when my grandmother died, I had two tattoos that signified what she meant to me. She was the most important person in my life. Again, I know so many of us have tribute tattoos to those special beings we've lost. Scarification marks were also used as a rite of passage. In many Aboriginal cultures, the rite of passage is initiation. So part of this ritual includes the initiated as well as close kin, marking scarifications on the part of their body connected to the person being initiated. Now I'm sure, even at my age of 45, that walking drunkenly down Hindley Street at 5am on your 18th birthday and getting a shit tattoo is still a rite of passage. People also get tattoos to signify a milestone or a certain time in their life for example, finishing their degree or birthing their first child. For beauty, marks were made because they were desirable. In Aboriginal cultures, an unmarked person was not desirable at all. For some groups, anyone not scarred in the right way was called a clean skin or unbranded and was not able to participate in many aspects of cultural life. A contributing factor of your desirability could be the warrior marks you hold for victory in battle. Beauty is the main reason I'm guessing most of us get tattoos these days, but it's certainly not the only reason, and even beauty is imbued with meaning. So this work is a digital image on canvas with weaving. Um, it's called collaboration. And this work speaks to the cooperative nature of the amazing women artists involved in this exhibition. And that's Amanda McKinnon, Simone Claire Heed, Bianca LeVay, and Amy Herman. Collaboration, as opposed to competition or dominion, always creates exceptional results. As with Homo sapiens, relationship with the natural world a collaborative approach to our environment and its, habit and its inhabitants create spectacular results. Dominion and competition create destruction. And you can apply this to any connections or collaborations. On the one hand, you have competition and dominion, capitalism. On the other hand, you have community, collaboration, This work, it's a di digital image on canvas. This Owsling I preserved, and this is Raffia and Emu Feathers. This is an image of my body in the way that I've used natives as an act of connecting to country and as an act of performative allyship. In searching for meaningful ways to country, I felt a desire to stitch country into my skin. And I found the way to do this was through the employment of contemporary tattoos. The human body in this image becoming a canvas to convey meaning, sovereignty, to connection to country, and indigenous pride, the colourfully Decorated body is attached to weaving an emu feather signifying culture. The wing is attached to the body signifying an indigenous worldview. 
the collaborative nature of existing on an equal footing with every living thing. This is another weaving work called Patience. For many Indigenous people living under colonial system based on racial hierarchies, life can feel hopeless, unpredictable, painful and unfair. And yet we continue getting up, standing up, speaking out for community and country. When you understand that we're all equal, every animal, vegetable, mineral, every atom, every molecule, then you'll understand that you have nothing to lose and nothing to fear. The materials in this piece include raffia, various ribbons and yarns, possum fur, domestic cat fur, electrical wires, sequins, and raffia. So now we're looking at the work by Bianca. This work up the top here is called Wimpin Bee. In Aboriginal cultures, our dreamings and song lines are continuously being innovated. Our dreamings are not a thing of the past, but rather an ever-evolving psychology and philosophy that encompasses all that has been, all that is, and all that will be. Aboriginal peoples find contemporary means to share their stories. Sarah Ellis today applies makeup while translating dreaming stories on TikTok. Rishikat shared a video of Miss Nadoc, young women in 2019, proudly showing their beauty, pride, and makeup skills. Katarina Leroy dances, and Ginger Art shares videos of their painting practice. Bianca extends this innovation in this artwork by signifying the use of makeup as part of their identity. Aboriginal peoples have been practicing body painting since time immemorial, but it's not the only way that we express our identity. Our identities are expressed in innumerable ways, including makeup, contemporary tattoos, song, dance, story, the artist is invigorated by the innovation, pride, social mindedness and creativity shown by Indigenous young people and seek to reflect this in this artwork. Win Pimpi is the word for lips in Pinajara. This work is called Expression. And this painting that Bianca illustrates the many different strategies that Aboriginal people use to signify our identities. The way we express our cultural identities and allyship outwardly to the world includes our employment of tattoos, jewellery, makeup, etc. Again, this work is called Not Blood Quantum. This painting signifies what lies beneath the skin. Bianca has creatively translated into this painting symbols representing blood, muscle and ligaments. The mark making signifies the never ending odyssey of the artist in continuously engaging in, in cultural discovery and identity. In this work, what lies beneath, we're again looking what lies beneath the surface of the skin. Because for Aboriginal peoples, our connection to country is more than skin deep. Our connection to country is included in every single atom and molecule of our bodies, in every cell. The colour palette for this painting is inspired by what lies on the skin. So is Bianca's favourite makeup palette. For Aboriginal people's connection to country runs deeper than the surface of the skin, as I said. And in this painting, Bianca offers us an interpretation of what lies beneath the skin. Depicting the connections to country that run so deep, they're embedded into every molecule and every cell of our body. In this painting, in this painting, 
painting, Bianca, it means good together in Pitanjara. And in this painting, she's depicting the importance of family connections to Aboriginal peoples. In an Indigenous worldview, these family connections extend to the natural world. So we have human family, but we also have non-human family. And that extends to every animal, every plant, the air, the water, the wind, everything in the natural environment. In this painting, Bianca is looking at Western constructs of land ownership. For Aboriginal people, we don't own this land. This land owns us. In this painting, Bianca is reminding us that we live on Aboriginal land that's never been ceded. And the people currently profiting from leasing or selling this land, they don't own it to begin with and neither do we. As I said, in an Indigenous worldview, we belong to the earth more than it belongs to us. And it's from this worldview we practice collaboration as opposed to dominion. So now we're looking at um, the print works that I've made. And they're all natives. Uh, at the top here we have the Waratah. Um, this one's called Strength. Because indigenous peoples from the Eora nation use the Waratah medicinally, placing the flowers into a bowl of water so the nectar can be soaked out. And then the flower water is drunk for pleasure. Uh, for its strengthening effect and for curing illnesses in children and the elderly. And this work down here is called Native Human, Get It Straight. And this is a um, photographic print with a lino print overlay. And this image basically speaks to the stereotypical ideas and assumptions about what it means to be an Aboriginal person in Australia today. The artist rejects the notion of blood quantum racial hierarchies and colorism. There's an old Aboriginal adage, you can put as much milk in your coffee as you like, it's still coffee. Meaning Aboriginal identity has nothing or little to do with skin color. It has more to do with your connections to community, country, and kin. This work up here is a cicada. It's a double drummer, which is indigenous to Australia, and it's the loudest cicada in the whole world. We have the most amazing, creative, and remarkable ecosystems right here on country. Every species is important to the existence of these ecosystems that work in collaboration with all life to maximise our survival. This work is a Sturt Desert Pea and it's called Boss. Because the Sturt Desert Pea, being one of Australia's most iconic flowers, is famous for its distinctive blood red leaf-like flowers each with a bulbous black center, which is called a boss, which is pretty boss. And this work up here is called Beautiful and Dangerous. And it's a native wasp. Wasp and bees indigenous to Australia are just as poisonous as our most poisonous snakes. As a stinging wasp, Postulus humilis, or the native wasp, has a very powerful defense mechanism. The venom in the sting of the species helps with prey capture and nest defense from predators. The venom comes from two tubular glands and is secreted by powerful muscles that coat the reservoir and squeeze out the venom. The venom is known to be used in fights between species as in, and is often used in limited amounts. 
The venom is largely made of serotonin, histamine, thiamine and dopamine which are all considered major pain producing components of the venom. These wasps are not aggressive but they will defend their nest. This work is a native bee and this one is called solitary sonification. The blue banded bee is a solitary bee that specializes in the technique of buzz, buzz pollinization or sonication, which is pollination involving vibrations. Honeybees and other non-solitary bees depend on the wind or landing on a plant to shake loose the pollen necessary for pollination. Sonification is a far more efficient system, resulting in the blue banded bee being responsible for the pollination of at least 30% of Australia's crops. Native bees have huge cultural significance to many indigenous peoples and have played a part in their cultures for thousands of years. Honey was highly prized and often given as gifts or traded as a valuable commodity. It was also used medicinally for cleaning out the gut. The honey produced by the native bee is often known as sugar bag. This work is called a native human. You've got it upside down. And again, this image speaks to the stereotypical ideas and assumptions about what it means to be an Aboriginal person in Australia today. You can see that my business partner Bianca and I are fair in skin, but that just does not diminish our Aboriginality in any way. Our connections with culture are very deep. This work is native flora on fauna. This native flora tattoo work was done by Simone Claire Heed and again, it was a practice for me, a process of connecting to country. Past government policies classified Aboriginal peoples as fauna as opposed to the Caucasian invaders who were classed as human beings. We see these hierarchies continue today in the form of systemic racism, lower life expectancy, higher rates of incarceration, etc, etc, etc. In reality, all human beings are fauna. This hierarchy has continued because human beings neglect to recognise themselves as such. Speciesism creates a hierarchy over which human beings have dominion. In an Indigenous worldview, Everything belonging to the natural world is equal. No species or plant or animal is any better or any worse than another. We are all necessary and we are all important. This work up here, you can see the cicada overlaid across it, the Bianca's face called Loud and Proud Homo Sapiens. In this piece, I'm speaking to my experience as an Aboriginal woman of being silenced, underestimated and not being taken seriously. This happens to me on the daily. This image speaks to the right of every Indigenous person to be heard, to get loud, to take up space, to get angry and to assert themselves without apology. This work with a native wasp overlay, beautiful and dangerous Homo sapiens. In this piece I'm asserting that like the wasp, as sovereign Aboriginal women, we are not aggressive. But if you try and disturb our nest, we will sting. And for Aboriginal women, the nest involves everything in the natural world. So if you try and disturb it, if you try and destroy it, if you try and exploit it, we'll sting. 
On behalf of Bianca and I, I'd like to say thank you so much for listening. Thank you for being interested in our work. We are sovereign. The exhibition will be hanging at Black Diamond Tattoo until the end of the year. Please come along and have a look. Tell your friends. Um, thanks again.